And without any further ado, Alfred, Mr. Daedalus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for, for coming out today and, and just, you know, being present in your musical community. I can tell each and all of you are, are musicians of different stripes, and I can see in your eyes. Um, really quick about myself, my name is Alfred Darlington. I'm coming from Los Angeles. I've been on the road for a, a hot minute this tour, um, ranging around mostly Southeast Asia, but some Australia, New Zealand. It's been a wonderful run. Um, in opposition to some of the other speakers, I'm really happy that we can present such diverse ideas today. Uh, I'm coming from a different stripe of performance. Um, a lot of it's rooted in the LA tradition of beats and bass and body music. What that's They're all terrible terms, but body music being a nice one, just things that kind of hit you somewhere between your gut and your chest and higher and lower. And my background before that, before this LA music scene kind of um, made me feel comfortable was in jazz, mostly jazz. Uh, I played double bass and bass clarinet, two instruments that are not easy alone. Rarely, um, either you're really, really good at it and it all makes sense, or you're like myself and not terribly good at it and um, trying to find your way. I went to school for jazz, uh, double bass major, and uh, about three years into it, I discovered that I didn't want to do that and I tried to pivot towards other things, and that was electronics. Um, personally, uh, that emphasis on electronics is an infinite possibility. The canvas that is there when you want to choose these kind of frequencies, these like, alt, you know, like just higher than the ears can hear and lower than the, than the body can feel, is, uh, is thrilling, but also very challenging to find your performance ends very hard to find the way that 10 fingers or whatever kind of system you're using to engage the computer space. It's hard sometimes to figure out where you fit into that infinity. And so I take a very practical approach. Um, after years of searching for the angle that I wanted to do in 2003, I discovered this machine called the Monome. I was very lucky to play a show with this guy, Brian Crabtree, when he had a prototype of this machine. Um, this is the precursor to a lot of grid-based systems. It's not that grids are new or unique or anything, it's just it was a really clever way of dealing with the music problem. And I only call it a problem because even to this day, there's just a thousand and one ways of attacking the issue, but truth of the matter is that unless you're really able to emote in that space, it isn't believable, you know? And I, I appreciate, again, this idea of automation and this idea that there's things that are set up and preconditioned and you're lowering chance, but that isn't what I signed up for. Um, playing a lot of shows, I want to have as much chance as possible. I want to have as much unruliness as possible and to consider the audience as much as possible. And that's one of the places where I'd really do appreciate the other gentleman's talk is that he was talking about really considering the audience as being the ultimate um, kind of conduit. Like you're trying to appeal to their experience as much as possible, but from a song-based perspective, you're trying to have sing-along moments in those kind of situations, whereas I'm not. <laughs> I think a lot of the time I, I don't hardly play any music that people know, um, at least at some of these shows. And this is challenging. I mean, people expect to be able to like kind of chime in, but, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just coming from a different tradition of DJing where your job as, as a DJ or as a performer was to present music that people didn't know and to advocate it. You know, At the end of the night, you want people to be buzzing because of the whole situation, not because necessarily the set of songs or the one song that you end up on because they don't know any of the other songs from the, from the record, but they know the one single. So they're just kind of waiting around on their hands for that song. It doesn't seem like the thing. Um, and so anyways, going back to the mono, it is a series of possibilities. It's an open source controller. It could be used for whatever. And people do. Um, some people just use it as a screensaver, which Trent Reznor famously did during one of his shows, which was kind of annoying. A lot of kit just having a lot of pretty lights, but neither here nor there. Uh, the way I'm using it and is displayed here is as a sample playback launching performative place. Once again, trying to physicalize as much of the music as possible. And what I'd like to do is just have you guys think about your own performance experience, whatever instruments you're using, whatever techniques you're using, just quickly in your mind's eye, just imagine that, that space, right? Now I want you to do is I want you to remove all the audio. Just you gesturing on device or playing an instrument. And I know we have all clear concepts of what that 
that is, I mean, you've done it, you can put yourself there, but as soon as you remove the audio, it becomes um, ridiculous to a degree. The instrument requires so much movement and so much kind of physicalization, but without the audio, where does it go? And that's one of the dilemmas of controllers. There's no resonators, there's no fingers on strings. You are just pouring yourself into this buttony thing. Uh, I'm happy this thing has wood sides and everything, but it's not the same. Um, and it needs that. I, I've talked about this uh, to some length in some previous um, speeches and stuff, but we really have a very clear concept of guitar face. Do you know this thing, guitar face? This like terrible, smushy face that people do when they're really feeling the solo that they're playing. But most people have no idea what the guitar is doing. They, I mean, they really, it's like, it could be, you know, it could be anything. It could be an accordion and it could be the same face, but it's that guitar face. And I think that as a, a motive, a uh, place of launching is, is, is powerful, but it's also, it's strange because we're not in that paradigm anymore. We're not having the soloistic music and yet this is a, a frame of reference that we're still encountering. And it, it will be that way forever. I mean, we're emotional connected people and you're looking for smiles. I mean, that's the loudest thing, louder than any bass drop or kind of strange uh, ratchet snares, uh, a smile is gonna like launch off things. And being, uh, being honest with that emotion is really powerful as well. So it's a lot of words um, just to kind of explain a little bit of the backdrop, but I think the, the music itself will probably explain better. And I'm gonna do a little of that now I'm going to mess around and then we can kind of talk about some signal path or technical things. Oh, really quick. I'm using Max MSP. It, it may be a program familiar to some of you, maybe not to others. Max is a programming language for music and sometimes visuals as jitter. It is the, I mean, in my, my opinion, I, I know this is kind of hearsay, but it's the root of Ableton. Ableton used to be like a really complicated Max patch and then it got transformed over time into a more stable otherwise. So my program does quit occasionally. It does decide to not work. And so again, going back to that other, other gentleman's um, kind of frame of reference, sometimes you don't want things to quit. Sometimes you want things to be perfect and to be seamless, which is reasonable. But I think people thrill at the chance that something's gonna go terribly wrong. I mean, we all have car crashes and stuff, right? Well, maybe not all of us, but it's, there's something to it. Um, yeah, and, and so sometimes the, the audio not working is, is the more powerful gesture, just to know that that you were there, that moment happened, there wasn't a perfection. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna play a little bit and we'll see where that goes in a little bit.
Thanks, guys. That's very nice of you. <laughs> so, not at all typical of what's going to happen tonight when I play Good God. That'll probably be totally different. Um, and I really appreciate the chance to be able to, to present those kind of differences. To be honest, um, that isn't necessarily like it's really nice when you have a reactive situation where you can encounter more. Um, I'm not saying that the seated stairs are um, are that a little different. That's all. It's a little different. Um, than tonight, which will hopefully be a sweaty mess. I'll be a sweaty mess. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of what I wanted to highlight a little bit, is that kind of consideration of audience interaction as being a, a real vital part. There is a, a tendency in electronic music towards the movie experience, where the situation is so sewn up, the visuals are so important, and the audio being kind of the redundancies all being there, that basically people are paying for a movie experience. And I, I'm a big fan of the not the other way around where people are, you're kind of all in it together and you don't know where the evening is gonna land. I think that's, at least this is, this is my thesis, this is my construct that I feel like is important to propagate. And so what happened just there will never happen again and nor maybe should it. But um, in terms of my file organization, and this is something for the musicians, your organization of your, of your setup, it, going back to the other speakers, it is super important the way you have things at your fingertips, the way your hands can reach out, make change, but reasonably enough, like if you have too much level of control, then you are doing yourself a disservice because you are, your mind is not on that audience that's there. Your mind isn't in the sound system that is your instrument in all actuality. The capability of the sound system you're dealing with is gonna change every night. And if you discredit that, if you just have your go-to routes and routines, you're not going to, to do it properly. It's gonna be wrong. So. And the, even if you have redundancies built in, you just have to still consider that for your mixes, be it a sound person yourself, and you are your own sound person always. So having your files organized in a way that allow you to deal with things, but not too much. Don't want to have too much heavy lifting. And so, for instance, on the, the larger modem, what they call 256, I have samples. And these samples range from other people's music to my own. Uh, I can break it down right here. This is a lot of Be Your Girl that Kei Trinata remix of that beautiful thing. And I didn't play any of it, but I can play some of it now. It's a little fast, but you can see. And I, I kind of swoon at these little synths myself. And so even though I'm using somebody else's music, I'm trying to utilize it in a way that allows me to conduct the sound I want to do. So. The monom allows, for instance, in, in this case, um, something that I really appreciate is that you can focus on just one element of that track. So that little isolation, it, it'll get too much too fast, but if you start layering that, if you start putting it in context, I feel like it actually can emotionally change the dynamic, be it because of harmony, melody, or rhythm. In this case, I've kind of set myself up to have the possibility of these two samples working together. All the different scenes that I was skipping through, and that's what they call them, scenes. In this case, just these different collections of samples are all set up to give myself as much chance of success as possible, but without anything being rulesy, without anything being promised or fulfilled necessarily. And that's why you heard some dissonance in that set and rhythmic dissonance as well. It's kind of, it sucks, but I feel like that's the price you have to pay to have a good night or a bad night. Um, is risk uh, and then reward. So you can see the isolations now. The, the machine does other kind of things as well. So it's, I'm able to isolate certain parts and pieces and then also uh, reverses pitch changes. Um, the 64 in opposition is working like a mixer. I have four channels, up to four samples playing at a time. I feel like for me personally, uh, you don't want to have an infinite amount of sound that goes together or else you are going to encounter either phasing or dissonances that are, are going to be hard to overcome from a musical standpoint. So I like to keep things somewhat limited in terms of their interactions. And then also the 64 has an accelerometer, which allows you to do, I mean, in this case, I'm using it for changing effects, reverbs, delays, some of the basic things that think reach out to people. 
it's, it's slightly nerdy stuff, but again, like any way that you can feel present, present is the thing. Um, to, to kind of circle back to one element that I am uncomfortable with, but I've embraced over time is being physical on stage. Uh, I get teased sometimes for my movements and for the upswing of, of arms and things. But uh, the truth of the matter is that you, you're playing an instrument. No matter what system you're on, you are playing an instrument. And so if you are not being present and physical on it, you are not playing that instrument. You are <laughs> you are checking your email or Snapchatting or some such. And that isn't what you're, you're there to do, probably. You know, you're probably there to perform. And that includes all kinds of things. I feel like... Um, Taking a stage, dressing up, playing a role more for yourself than for the audience is critical. Just really allowing yourself to be comfortable in your situation and performative because at the end of the day, that's you are reaching through that instrument and grabbing people by the throat or the hair or um, that, that's a strange metaphor. But yeah, you're, you're doing things to them. <laughs> Gosh, I've been on the road for a little while. Um, so... So you're, so you're trying to affect and affect people, you know, and uh, whatever gives yourself the most leeway for that is possible. So I am a big fan of when you're on stage, you are like really representing that truth, that promise, that possibility. Now, just another thing, uh, one of the gentlemen was talking about being a DJ, uh, Max Maxwell, yeah, I think was talking about being a DJ um, in that situation having, I mean, I, I really like the continuous idea that it, it, the music never stops, but the idea that you have to entertain people is kind of controversial. I mean, we're entertainers and performers, but the idea that you're not putting inspiration first is troubling to me because a lot of people get entertained um, from, from really basic stuff and uh, we can, I, I have an aspiration towards some more and I don't think there's anything wrong with being a party DJ or being someone that makes people happy. I think that's wonderful, but the truth of the matter is, is that uh, I feel like you sustain longer if you have a loftier goal. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, when you do this for a little while, I think you, you get some insight into why to get up the next day and do it again. And if, if money is the central course, then you're already, that's like, that's pretty tough times right there. But uh, I mean, I guess some people, they, they make it work. But um, yeah, I think trying to find something a uh, loftier, greater is, is worth it. And simply uh, making people happy is a beautiful thing, but also inspiring, I think, is more central, at least to my purpose. And I would, I would challenge you to feel the same or at least look for the same. Now, uh, my life hasn't just ended at the monom and this other things. Again, I've been using it since 2003, so I've always been kind of aspirational towards other, other ideas. So recently, I just, I just wanted to mention this briefly, but recently I encountered this new idea of instead of releasing another record and going through the same kind of the rigmarole, which you guys, some of you might be experienced with the, the six months of preparation, years, 10 years, 20 years, or however long to make a record, and then you give it to a label and then they dissect it and they regurgitate it and then you basically are stuck with whatever other people think about it. Um, I recently made an instrument called the Delatalus. And uh, it's just a little sampler and playback unit. And it's been such a joy to be able to give something that other people are gonna make their records with or have their fun with. And not a solid piece of something that just exists on a, I mean, this is gonna sound really grim, but another record to go on the pyre of a thousand records that come out every Tuesday or Monday or whatever, that just get burned. So, onto people's hard drives, but whatever. So, I've been having a lot of, I've been, finding a lot of joy in that and giving people the the opportunity and the tools to, to kind of make and this kind of circles back to the performance thing because I think when you do that properly you are creating somebody's reality you know going out to shows as a, as a culturation I think is what the phrase is people don't just automatically um, go out to a show and have a good time and know how to dance know how to react know how to handle their alcohol their inebriation it's all it's a skill that people learn and um, we're losing that slightly with some of the massive festivals and events. It's definitely changing the focus of things. Um, so nights like tonight, these small, smaller nights where people can kind of come together and just have a crack, if using the Irish term, C-R-A-C, it's a useful, useful word if you guys ever come across it. Just having a party is, is a, an amazing thing. And it's, it's a wonderful uh, and humbling thing to be part of. Thanks, Gus. That's very nice of you.